Hi folks, I'm Noelle Cockett, president of Utah State, and I am so glad to be here with you today. For the last two decades, the university president has given an annual State of the University talk. And in that talk, they show the successes of the year and what's out there in the future. Well, I got to do it this year, which has been incredible, as all of you know. We have survived a worldwide pandemic, and I challenge another university president at USU to be able to make that claim. Not only did we do uh, to survive it, but we have actually flourished during this last year. We have had success after success after success, and that's what I want to share with you in today's talk. We anticipate for years uh, ahead, people analyzing what the COVID pandemic did to higher education. One of the studies that's been done uh, was conducted by a professor at SUNY, and he looked at all of the universities that are ranked in the US News and World Report. But instead of looking at the regular USU uh, News rankings, he did it on value versus vulnerability. And he actually valued, uh, looked at the value, access, and flexibility for each of the institution as a prediction of how they would do during the pandemic and coming out post-COVID. And you can see from this slide, USU is in the Thrive category. Only 88 schools were given that designation. Utah State was one of those, and only the only one in Utah to be uh, considered to thrive during the pandemic and to come out of it stronger than ever. And I'm gonna show you some of the reasons that this professor considered us to be one of the best. First, on value. Unfortunately, we did have to raise tuition and fees this year to cover the match that's required for the state legislature uh, salary compensation. Uh, it requires us to obtain about 25% of what's been approved from tuition. That resulted in a 2.6, 2.7% increase and tuition and fees across our whole university system. But even with that increase, you can see that Utah State is an incredible value. It's compared on this slide uh, to the uh, Rocky Mountain schools, the Wichi schools, our peer land grant institutions, and the Carnegie four-year public research two institutions. In every case, USU is below the average tuition and fees for that. So while we deeply uh, think about every time we ask students and their families to pay more for tuition and fees, we believe in the value that we're giving them. Another look at value for Utah State is this ranking done by Washington Monthly. We've been in the top 15 for the last four years in this ranking. And they show under the bullets under methodology what they actually look at. Very, very different than the US News and World Report ranking, which actually puts a lot on recognition by other institutions. On the right, you can see that Utah State ranks 254 with the US News and World Report but number 10 under the Washington Monthly Ranking. Now, if I had to choose, I would much rather have Utah State known for the, the rankings that Washington Monthly uses, and I've highlighted a couple of them that really focus on net, or the value that we give our students. The net price, tuition and fees, the student loan defaults, which I'll mention in just a sec in more detail, and the earnings of our graduates. In other words, USU 
education has incredible value on the return of investment that people do when they come here. The student loan default is an interesting uh, measurement. This you actually want low, low um, because this is the number of students who have taken out federal loans but then defaulted in pass, paying them back. USU is the lowest in the state at 5% default rate and considerably lower than the national average of 11%. Another indication that our students get the kind of education that they need to get out into the careers that they've chosen to pursue. Um, the measurement that the SUNY professor did also looked at access. And one of the ways that we focus on access is providing financial aid to our students. In 2019-20, we allocated over $102 million of scholarships to over 12,000 students. And we're very, very proud of this. Many of these came from the institution scholarships that are across the college and departments, but also the private philanthropy that our alumni and friends give to Utah State is incredibly valuable when we want to help students with aid. Our students also are applying for federal aid with the FAFSA program. And there we gave out $90 million in grants and loans to almost 13,000 students. And then finally, I have to call attention to the free credits that our students get on the tuition plateau. Between 12 and 18 credits, students only pay as if they're taking 12 credits. This last year, our students were collecting over 87,000 student credit hours on that tuition plateau, saving $23 million worth of tuition. Again, access is so uh, supported by the financial aid we give our students. We also were particularly focused on helping our students during the COVID pandemic. Many of them had uh, cut back on hours in their jobs. Some had medical uh, expenses due to COVID. Some could not go to their jobs because of self-isolation and quarantine. So using the federal COVID CARES Act, we were able to distribute $10 million to over 11,000 students with small grants to help when they were having an emergency such as rent or food or needing help with their technology as we move to a, remote, a more remote basis. The uh, University Student Affairs Office also distributed hardship money using a private fundraising effort from our donors where they raised over $290,000 to give out to 514 students. And then finally, in fall semester, we refunded the student fee. It wasn't very much for each individual student, about $150, but all together, we refunded $2.9 million on those student fees that they were charged. We also anticipate distributing more money starting in spring semester through summer and fall using the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund, which we refer affectionately to as CARE 2.0. And we anticipate another $8.7 million in aid to our students. Again, making it possible for them to continue their education at Utah State even during the COVID pandemic. Another value that gave us that Thrive designation was the flexibility that we give our students in delivery mode of our classes. In spring 2020, who can forget the big pivot in March? And I think it was March 18th when we had to convert all our face-to-face -face sections 
to some type of remote delivery. And we did it with amazing success. Over 5,000 classes and sections were converted to remote delivery in less than five days. And it was a tough, tough period of time. But I give huge, huge thanks and kudos to our faculty, our instructors, and our city staff for making that possible. Although we thought that COVID would end and, uh, by the end of summer, and we would be back to normal in fall 2020, as things happened, that was not one of them. And we had to continue to look at remote delivery as the number of COVID cases was continuing to escalate across the state, our campus, and the world. But again, our faculty and instructors, along with our staff, knocked it out of the park. We added an additional 1,100 remote se sections. But in response to what our students wanted, that face-to-face -face contact with our instructors and our faculty and our each, each of the other students, we also uh, organized 1,200 sections where there was face-to-face -face hybrid. Some of the students doing it remote, some of the students doing it in the classroom. And while the whole class couldn't attend at any one time, we really were able to give that face-to-face -face interaction that the students see so important here at Utah State. And now in spring semester, we continue to expand our remote uh, sections, but again, focusing on that blended face-to-face -face and broadcast remote and online sections. Well, time to look at our resilience. Of course, COVID was an incredibly what unusual time for us, but by pulling experts from all across the university, building capacity in our emergency management and our risk management offices, we were able to, again, knock it out of the park during the COVID pandemic. One of the strategies we used was testing, very, very aggressive testing, starting in September of September 21 of last fall. And since that time, we have done over 32,000 tests for COVID here at Utah State University, 29,000 on the Logan campus, but we also extended that testing capability to the Eastern Blanding and Brigham City campuses. And we absolutely believe that surveillance for COVID, identification of positive cases was instrumental in handling our infection rates. By contacting those students through our case containment team, we were able to provide these people, both staff and students, information on what they needed to do to self-isolate. By having conversations with them and doing contact tracing, we were able to identify the people that had been exposed to that infection and provide information on quarantine to them as well. It didn't end there though. Our COVID care team worked and our case containment team worked on a daily basis with those people to make sure that they were uh, able to get through their classes, to help them with food or housing or medical emergencies, keeping them safe while they kept others safe by staying home. You can see the interesting graph of our USU seven day COVID case trend. Slowly after uh, class, classes started in September, we had a bit of a rise. But by doing targeted testing at some of our resident halls, we were able to lower that. And then Halloween happened. And a lot of our students uh, had some activities where maybe they weren't being quite as careful with masks and social distancing. That in, ended up giving us a very dramatic infection peak that lasted for the first couple of weeks of November. Then people returned from Thanksgiving uh, holidays, a little bit of a peak there, uh, low over Christmas holidays, 
and then a very, very st steady but decline in our infection rates since then. So very, very proud of everyone who helps us keep safe by testing. We also focused on a wastewater monitoring. This was done by the team of Ryan DuPont, uh, shown in the top uh, 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 graph there, and his team collecting from wastewater collection sites. And then Keith, Keith Roper's group uh, tested those wastewater samples for COVID RNA. What a wonderful way to have early alert surveillance on what was happening on our resident halls, the streets and complexes surrounding our Logan campus, and also on the Logan or the Price and Blanding campus. And I just want to give a shout out to Ryan DuPont, who yesterday received the Carnegie Lifetime Achievement Award at our faculty award ceremony. But as I said, even during a COVID pandemic, our university flourished. And I'd like to show you a few stories highlighting some of our, our really great things that happened in 2020. And down in the corner of the slide, you can actually see the site, the website, where you can get more information on these stories and others that have happened over the last year. Right here, I'm showing two really interesting uh, research projects that are helping keep our natural resources, land, water, and air safer for all of us. Janice Bra Brainy uh, was uh, nationally recognized for her work on microplastics, which unfortunately are accumulating in our water systems. Seth Lyman at the Uinta Basin is doing work on air quality monitoring, again, helping with uh, safe and reliable land, water, air uh, quality and quantity. Continuing with research, of course, we can't uh, uh, be complete without mentioning our Space Dynamics Lab. This is a comet that was discovered by a telescope that was built by SDL. And uh, here's a shot of that, uh, like flashing across the sky. We've also shown Joshua Livey, who is at the USU Eastern campus and uh, reclassified a prehistoric giant marine lizard. And what is really cool about these last two slides is that not only are we doing research on our Logan campus, we are also doing research across our statewide system at Uinta Basin, at USU Eastern, Joe Wilson at Tooele, et cetera, et cetera. It goes all across the state. We also, as the land grant, have a requirement, a mission of outreach. And this is bringing research-based information to individuals and communities so that they can have improvements in their life. The one uh, photo of people is our very own Utah Climate Center. This is a state-funded uh, legislative line that's actually located and run by our USU faculty, including uh, Rob Gillies, the director of USU or Utah Climate Center, his colleague Simon Wang, and uh, others. And uh, they're really doing a lot to predict uh, climate and therefore a uh, quantity of water that's available to all of us in the future. And then I'd also like to do a special recognition of Susan Madsen. Susan was recently brought to Utah State uh, into the Karen Huntsman, Huntsman Endowed Professorship in the Huntsman School of Business. She is known across the state for her dynamic and wide-reaching programs of women and girls leadership. Super excited to have her here at Utah State. I now want to turn to some of our student accomplishments. We have the best students in the state, if not the country. And it's because of our great faculty and instructors who support them. This is just one example of that. Our faculty in interior design, including Darren Brooks 
and Steve uh, Mansfield and others have taken our students to national competitions for years and been very, very successful, including this last year where they placed in the National Discover Student Design Competition for some of their beautiful designs that are shown uh, on this slide. And I envision wallpaper and carpet and countertops and other things done with these beautiful artwork. We also have had incredible success with the Goldwater Scholars Program uh, spearheaded many, many years by David Peak, a faculty member in physics. And we have had another two scholars named for the 2021 year. This brings us 36 scholars and 19 honorable mentions since 1998 with an incredible uh, gratitude to our faculty and Chris Miller and the Honors Program for helping prepare these students to be competitive in the Goldwater Scholars Program. We also were recognized for our undergraduate research by the Council of Undergraduate Research in 2020, one of three national institutions given that recognition. And I'd like to do a special shout out to Joyce Kincaid, who through many, many years sustained and developed and grew our undergraduate research program. She was recognized yesterday for the University Service Award for this work with undergraduate research, as well as working with Sid Peterson on Year of the Woman over the last couple years. Congratulations, Joyce. And then Alexis Sand in the University Research Office is now doing an incredible job working with our undergraduate researchers and our poster on the Hill. I'd also like to give a shout out to our student athletes. What a year doing an incredibly complicated and um, tough uh, pandemic for our student athletes. Some of these athletes have been tested three to four times a week for COVID. They've been in self-isolation, they've been in quarantine, their games and their matches have been canceled, they've had compressed seasons, uh, many of our fall sports are now happening in the spring. A really, really special recognition of the resilience that our student athletes have shown. But once again, success. Our men's basketball team was invited to the NCAA tournament a couple of weeks ago for the 22nd time in school history. Our men's cross country team was incredibly successful in the NCAA Division I National Championships. Our gymnastics team coached by uh, Coach Smith ranked number 22 nationally and is in the NCAA regionals. And then we are so proud of our student athletes for their academic successes. We had 54 football players earn their academic All Mountain West honors for their um, scholastics. And we had the highest graduation success rate in the Mountain West Conference at 93%. Kudos to all our student athletes, their coaches, and the athletic department staff for taking such, uh, doing such great recognition of athletics as well as academics. Our research programs continue to also flourish. I seem to be using that word very, very often today, but there's no better way to describe it. Our research expenditures have climbed over the last five years, and they're now at a record high, almost 300 million uh, expected in the 2020 uh, year. And of course, a lot of this is due to Space Dynamics Lab, but also to our research faculty on our campuses. In fact, the research office anticipates another record year in the coming year because of the number of proposals that have been submitted over the last 12 months. Our people have not been idle during the pandemic. 
This has resulted in an improvement in our ranking across our, our land grant peers, which are listed here. As you can see, we now rank fourth in research expenditures against this group of, of institutions. And notice who we uh, are actually ahead of, Oregon State and Kansas State. And so again, thank you to our research faculty and staff for doing such an amazing job in securing funding and putting that into research programs. We are an institution that focuses on impact. We care about the impact that our research and our outreach has on our communities, our families, and individuals. One of the impacts we had shown here is the Space Dynamics Lab, the OSIRIS REx program, which the Space Dynamics Lab built the electronics for. for. This is a space uh, craft that has gone out and tracked an asteroid, uh, acquiring images and a soil sample, and as I understand it, is jetting back to the Earth so it can land in the Utah desert in 2023. And I was thinking, I would love to touch a sample of an asteroid. Not sure it'll be possible, but maybe I could use the president's card to make that happen. Another fantastic research program we have is the USU Aspire, which is focused on electric vehicle and transportation. This is run by Regan Zane, a faculty member who was brought to USU uh, through the USTAR program. He received a very large NSF grant, but continues to secure funding from private uh, companies and through state and federal grants. And we anticipate the electric vehicle research uh, building out on our innovation campus will expand in the very near future to accommodate all of these exciting programs uh, that they are doing. Another special shout out to Regan Zane, who was named the 2021 Researcher of the Year at yesterday's award ceremony. We also are particularly proud of our antiviral uh, research group that uh, when the COVID pandemic broke, they were immediately contacted and awarded an NIH grant to begin looking at antiviral compounds and drugs for their treatment of the COVID virus. Uh, they continue to support uh, antiviral research across a number of different uh, uh, viruses that could be, unfortunately, our next pandemic. And finally, I'd like to focus on a new program uh, that pulls together all the expertise we have in research, outreach, and education in land, water, air. The Institute of Land, Water, Air. Special shout out to Neil Abercrombie, Vice President for Government Relations, and uh, his, uh, his staff, uh, Jen Seeley, who are really bringing attention to the amazing capacity that USU has in these areas. In fact, we've collected names and programs of 143 faculty who have direct impact in these areas. And we hope to leverage them across state, federal, and community needs on land, water, and air. I tell people, when you have needs, land, water, and air, think USU. We're also distributing our information on our great research and outreach programs through two different uh, speaking uh, sessions. The first is the Blue Plates Research Program, replacing our Sunrise Program, that's a partnership with Regent Blue Cross Blue Shield. This is focusing on health and well-being. Next, uh, next session will be Tuesday, April 20th, where Brian Higginbotham and his colleagues in the uh, Human Development and Family Research Program, HDFC, uh, will be talking about strengths and stresses of family relationships. I hope you can attend that.
We also have continued to do our research landscapes, which is focused on land, water, air. Again, telling people about our strengths and research in these areas. And this is sponsored by OC Tanner uh, down in the OC Tanner campus on State and 21st South. And we've been able to communicate our successes in these areas across hundreds of community leaders, legislators, and uh, others. So we had a very, very successful legislative funding year again thanks to Neil Abercrombie. I mentioned before, we did get uh, salary compensation at 3%, which we will be dividing between a salary increase that is based on performance uh, across the past couple of years, as well as a flex pool that can be used by supervisors, deans, and vice presidents for merit, equity, and salary comp, uh, compression. And so these uh, increases will be implemented July 1st of this year. We also were successful in performance funding. This is based on USU's accomplishments with our students, retention, graduation, completion, et cetera. And uh, we'll get $4 million of ongoing funding starting July 1st. To distribute this money, uh, myself and, uh, and Provost Gailey, Vice President Dave Cowley, Vice President Abercrombie, will be doing budget hearings where each Vice President and Dean will come in with a prioritized list of requests for funding in the coming year. And I look forward to hearing those priorities. We were also able to get legislative funding for specific programs, which I'm showing here on the slide. Uh, Susan Madsen with the Utah Women in Leadership Project was given a, a funding for her staff. Uh, we have um, Center for School of the Future uh, with Parker Fawson, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Really, really exciting programs that the state believes, Utah State, the Utah's land grant institution can deliver. And finally, we were successful in getting funding for a new building over on the southwest corner of the quad next to Raby West. A, a sketch of that is shown here. That is the Mehdi Haravi Global Teaching and Learning Center building where we will bring all of the languages, the intensive English uh, um, program, computer labs, communication labs, English writing labs right there for people to exchange uh, language and learn about each other's culture. Finally, moving forward. Okay, we have to talk a little bit about what the upcoming months will look like. Many of you have heard that the governor is possibly going to do a removal of the mask mandate on April 10th. However, he has given institutions, businesses, companies, et cetera, the ability to keep the mask mandate as they feel is necessary. And USU feels it's necessary. Having masks, social distancing, wastewater monitoring, testing, and all the myriad of other things we've done have allowed us to keep our campuses and centers open through even the most horrific times of, of infections. And we know that masks help reduce that risk of infection. So we are gonna continue the mask mandate, even if lifted by the governor for the state, we will keep that in place at least through spring semester because we want to finish strong. We wanna hold those student activity and events that our students are looking so forward to. We want to have that graduation ceremony in person with two guests per every graduate. And that comes with a little more uh, perseverance on these uh, conditions that we know reduce the risk of infection. However, we think that as the summer goes, there may be less need for masks. 
there may be reduced social distancing. We're particularly interested in the reduction of social distancing so we can put more students safely into our face-to-face -face classes. This would happen potentially in late summer, hopefully by fall, and we feel that that social interaction is so important that if we could maybe reduce the social distancing, we would still be willing to wear those masks. And students across the board have agreed with that sentiment. I also want to encourage you, uh, those of you that can, to look to the COVID-19 vaccination. As you know, the state of Utah has lowered that to anyone 16 and older, one of only four or five states that actually has that wide distribution of the vaccine. We've sent out a lot of information and posted it on our COVID website where you can get that vaccination. And we hope that all of you are pursuing that because that's another way we're gonna be able to return and repopulate our campuses. Now we're looking at a gradual repopulation, similar, although in opposite directions, of when we went remote. Just as we used the county by county uh, work remote directions, we will use the Utah low transmission rate to guide us when a county is at a level that allows us to feel comfortable returning to work. Um, excuse me, returning to the university. I know we've all continued to work across this last year. However, it's not a flip the switch. One day, the county's transmission rate drops to low. Next day, everybody's back in their office. It's a gradual process that looks to our supervisors to help our employees feel safe when they return back to the campuses and centers. So watch for that and be ready when you feel comfortable. Now at some point, we are all gonna need to come back. That's to experience, give all of our people that eggy spirit, that eggy look, that eggy experience. So could be later in the summer, could be fall semester, and once we're all back on campus, then we'll look at ways that people may be able to do their job remotely on different kinds of schedules, uh, maybe situations that require them to look at childcare, family care, uh, medical emergencies, et cetera. But we will repopulate the university um, at some point, hopefully in the near future. And finally, a lot of really exciting things are gonna come out of our post-COVID task force. This is a group of uh, administrators, um, deans, vice presidents, et cetera, who are coming together to look across the entire campus to make sure that we continue to thrive as a university in the post-COVID era. And again, what a year, what a year. Um, it's been amazing. So I just want to thank all of you who are listening today to know that you pay, played a part in Utah State's success. We're Aggie strong, we're Aggie ready, we're the Aggie community, and we will continue to be all that we can be for the people that we serve. So thank you. And now I think there might be some questions. Great, thank you, President Cockett. On behalf of the entire Aggie family, we thank you for your dedication and resilient leadership, especially this past year. No one could have predicted all that we would have had to overcome during this pandemic. USU has and will thrive as predicted with you at the helm. So thank you. Thanks. First question that we have is, will USU still offer testing to students and employees this summer and fall? Yes, we certainly will. Our numbers are, are quite low, so um, you know, get out there, get a test. But again, we feel that this is very, very important for our handling of COVID. So we intend to do it uh, right through fall semester. At our East Stadium, which is uh, drive up, 
We've been doing randomized uh, surveillance testing in Eccles Conference Center on Tuesdays. Uh, Price, Blanding also continuing that testing. So yes, we're actually talking about at the end of spring semester, offering clinics, testing clinics, so students can have a test right before they leave campus, knowing that uh, they can mingle uh, with friends and family uh, at the end of the semester. So watch for that announcement. Thank you. You mentioned that we probably won't be back to normal in the fall, but what will classes and activities look like? Well, with the changes uh, the, uh, uh, that we're seeing in the COVID, shall we call it, battle of lowering infection rates, we think that uh, one of the first things we'll look at is reducing that social distance. That means more people can be together uh, in activities and events and in the classroom. So we anticipate more face-to-face -face sections and more students in those classrooms. But that may still require that we have masks, plexiglass, hand sanitizers, et cetera. Of course, we're moving into the summer and the fall, which are absolutely beautiful here in Utah. So another way we anticipate increasing the number of activities and events is holding even more outside. Again, with masks, uh, with some social distancing, but we know how eager people are to be together and enjoy that USU experience. Thank you. How has Utah State University been able to keep people employed throughout the pandemic? We've been able to keep employed, uh, people employed by great flexibility and resilience. You know, we've had to add staffing because of COVID. We have a very, very robust uh, case containment, contact tracing group. We have people in the testing facilities. We have the COVID care team. And so we were able to take those units who had a reduction in requests for their work, such as event services or um, you know, some of the, the classroom maintenance, and move those over into co more COVID-focused uh, jobs, and that has allowed us to keep our people employed. And for you students, if you're interested, now that we're in spring, our landscaping crew are very, very active. And uh, so watch for job employment opportunities there. Thank you, President. You mentioned some amazing research that uh, Utah State University has been able to conduct over the past year. But how has the university been able to conduct this research safely during the COVID Per, uh, while still observing COVID precautions? So as the COVID pandemic unfolded, <laughs> we created a lot of working groups. Two of the most critical working groups for keeping our campus safe were the, is the COVID Safety Committee, chaired by Mike George in Risk Management, and the COVID Action Committee, chaired by Ellis Brew in Emergency Management. And these groups have met literally daily, sometimes more than da daily, to review plans of department, research programs, laboratories, classrooms, et cetera, to make sure that they have the proper safety controls in there, such as social distancing, plexiglass, um, you know, sanitation, uh, broad scale um, uh, cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. So our research labs are not running as usual with uh, all these precautions, but they still are very, very functional and still very, very successful. So I, again, want to thank all of our people in the research labs, the faculty, major advisors, students, staff, for adhering to these safety precautions and therefore able to continue the research that we're doing. Is there a USU plan to provide COVID-19 vaccination clinics on campus this spring? So Ellis Brew and others have been in conversation with Bear River Health Department, which serves Cache Valley and therefore our Logan campus. There is hope that they will get enough doses that they can actually bring the, some of those doses to Logan campus, 
possibly in the Eccles Conference Center on a certain day. Uh, people will be able to register for uh, the vaccination uh, until uh, the slots are gone. So first come, first serve. But the caveat is that these doses, uh, the second dose of a Pfizer or Moderna, is given to the area that gave the first dose. So one of the stipulations of those who sign up for our vaccination clinic is that they will still be in Cache Valley and able to get their second dose through Bear River Health. So again, watch for announcements on that. We think that this will start in mid-April. But even if you can't come to one of our USU vaccination clinics, there are a lot of other opportunities to get that. So again, we've posted where you can click to find those areas, uh, drugstores, hospital, clinics, et cetera, that are giving out those vaccinations and they are free. So please look at that and uh, get yourself vaccinated. <laughs> Thank you, President. Um, next question is, um, we've overcome a lot over the past year, but has USU seen a drop in enrollment for fall of 2020 and spring of 2021 due to the pandemic? You know, it's been really interesting to watch enrollment numbers. We are down uh, about 1%, but that's not across the whole university. It actually turns up our freshman numbers were up about three to 4%. No doubt because re freshmen were previously high school seniors who had a virtual end to their high school and they and their parents were ready for those students to go to college. Um, so we really love having the freshmen and they've um, just shown incredible uh, willingness to do the things we ask of them so they can have that, that college experience. What we have seen drop are international students, again, with all the COVID restrictions, et cetera, on people traveling internationally, and also to some degree our continuing students. And I think our continuing students were just a little bit wearied by all the restrictions that were put on, on their education and are maybe planning to return uh, when we have more normal experiences. So for those of you that have stepped out, come back this fall. Thank you. We have a question about um, travel restrictions for the summer as it relates to field research, um, field courses, uh, including international travel. Has there been any changes in our travel policy? You know what? I think you have stumped me. Uh, I believe we're following CDC guidelines on international travel. So that means if you are planning to, to travel uh, to another country, absolutely make sure you go out on CDC website and find out whether it's possible to enter that country and what kind of testing or vaccinations you need before you will be accepted. On our field courses, we see again some reduction, we anticipate some reduction in social distancing. And if there's a reduction, that means there will be more people that can go out safely on our field trips. Um, so um, we certainly haven't cut off any field trips, but what has happened is it's reduced the number of people that can travel in a single vehicle and how close they can be out on in the field. So with things continuing to improve over the next couple of months, it's possible more people will be able to be on an individual field trip and possibly be in a vehicle. But again, it's likely, um, and I would say almost certain, that you'll need to wear masks. So for those of you students who would like to do a field trip, uh, reach out to your department. And for our faculty, reach out to your department head uh, to better understand how those can be implemented. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about whether employees can return to campus now if they feel 
um, they've been working from home but now feel safe to come back, or should they wait for the initial announcement to come out about this? We'd really like you to wait until the announcement comes. And again, that's the county by county Utah transmission rate. Um, because that's based on, you know, the, the number of cases across the county, the positivity rates, et cetera, et cetera. And that'll give us an extra assurance that when we bring people on to back into our centers and our offices, that we can maintain that low infection rate. So uh, I know we've been doing a lot of split shifts that's working. Uh, we've done a lot of plexiglass, um, social distancing, hand sanitizer. It's all working great, but for that next step, let's wait till we hit that low transmission rate. Thank you. We have a um, question. We did announce the graduation plans for the class of 2021. Are there any graduation plans in place for the class of 2020? Well, I'd like to first um, acknowledge uh, uh, the excitement that we've generated by having a graduation ceremony and convocation for our graduating 2021 class. As you've heard, uh, we're going to have a modified uh, calendar where small groups, uh, depending upon where they're located, the Danes Concert Hall or the Spectrum, small groups can process, enter, uh, walk across the stage while their name's being read, pick up their diploma, and have up to two guests per graduate. This will occur um, here on the Logan campus, as well as all the statewide campuses, uh, but it does require a venue that it still allows us to do appropriate social distancing. Because of that restriction, it hasn't been possible for us to enlarge the numbers and include the 2020 class. So what we see there is a very, very special week in the fall for a reunion back specifically for our 2020 graduates with opportunities to have photographs on the A, uh, to, to be on stage, to have their families, et cetera, et cetera, as well as a lot of other alumni events uh, to celebrate their graduation. So watch for that in the fall. Thank you. Um, will there be any more mandatory COVID testing on campuses for spring semester vaccinated students had been exempt from this testing, would it matter when the vaccine was received or the variety of vaccine for this exemption, if there is one? So yes, we do have a randomized surveillance testing that occurs every Tuesday. And based on the formula, uh, the state uh, indicates we should have about 250 students tested with the rapid Binex um, on our Eccles Conference Center. Again, this is on our Logan campus. Eastern and Blanding have their own testing uh, situations, which I'll mention in a minute. So we, we send out a notice to the random 250 students each week, and we ask them if they've been vaccinated. And I believe it's their vaccination needs to have been complete, both doses, and proof of their vaccination uploaded into a special portal in service now. Uh, if they can demonstrate that vaccination or if they can demonstrate they've been positive over the last 90 days, they are held exempt from this random uh, testing. So uh, it doesn't matter which vaccine, it can be the Moderna, the Pfizer, or the Johnson, but it has to show that the vaccination dosage, um, whether it's one or two, has been complete and that form uploaded into uh, the COVID questionnaire. Um, we appreciate all of the students that have agreed to do that random surveillance, and we once again are knocking it out of the park. In the last seven weeks of this random surveillance testing, we've only had two positives demonstrating that uh, 
our campuses have a very low infection rate. Eastern continues to offer a weekly testing, although numbers have dropped. Blanding has actually moved to a test upon request because the San Juan County vaccination program has been so successful. Almost every citizen resident of that county has been vaccinated. A follow-up question to that, President. After uh, an individual has completed the series of vaccinations required, will we be able to return to campus without masks? Or, and will there be a mixed phase of masks and no masks as we return to campus? You know, the COVID Safety Committee, COVID Action Committee, we have another large group called the Stabilization Task Force. We talked about this when we realized that, you know, at some point, masks would not be necessary and that there would be wide um, um, uptake of the vaccination. But we're not there yet. And that's the problem uh, where I think I saw maybe 17 to 18 percent of Utah residents have actually had both doses of vaccine, meaning there's a lot of people that aren't vaccinated and we are still having positive cases through our testing center the East Stadium almost every day, meaning that COVID is out there. So rather than saying and assuming someone without a mask has been vaccinated and assuming without assuming a person with a mask has not, we are simply requiring everyone to be masked. It is possible for a vaccinated person to become infected, although with a much uh, less severe case, but because they still can be infected, we want everyone to wear a mask. I don't know when that day will come, uh, it will, but let's keep going with the masks. It's been so effective. Uh, it's not forever. Let's just keep keeping those masks on when you're around other people. President, you mentioned a phase in approach to getting employees back on campus. How do you envision that looking for staff over the summer and more specifically, do you foresee flexibility in staff working on campus or from home, or are you ha hoping to have all staff back in the office full-time over the summer? The timing of that is still uncertain. Uh, again, if uh, based on that one graph that I showed with the infection rate continuing to steadily decline, that would suggest that if it continues on that slope, we will be ready to go in fall. But it also has many other factors. What's happening out in the community, across the nation, and across the world. And there are some people that predict, with states removing mask mandates, that there could be another peak of infection coming up. So rather than saying, by such and such a date, we will be back on campus, let me talk about how that will happen. At some point, we will ask everyone to come back. Now there, again, that's why it's not a flip of the switch. It's a gradual thing. It's the supervisor being able to assure that individual staff person that they will be safe, whether it's plexiglass, whether it's social distancing, hand sanitizer, et cetera, et cetera. It will be that person's uh, willingness to come back into campus. We're hoping people do avail themselves with the vaccination. Another way to help people uh, keep safe. Eventually though, all things told, it will be time. And we want everyone to return, repopulate the university. And at that point, we will talk about what remote looks like at Utah State in the future. And the reason is because how we did remote work at Utah State was in reaction to a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic, and probably not the best strategy for a long time, continued, regulated, supervised, et cetera, et cetera, remote work. So we realized that we can function we want to continue with those conversations, but we're not there yet what remote work 
at Utah State looks like in a post-COVID world. So my point being, we're all going to come back. It is so important that we continue with that Aggie experience. We're not an online institution. We are a full college experience. Our students, our alumni, our parents, our customers, our stakeholders, they expect to have a vibrant, lively, traditional experience here. And that's what I want to give them. Again, doesn't mean someday we won't have a great program for remote work, but it isn't based on what we did during the pandemic. Um, so we know when you can start returning to work, that's when the Utah County goes to low transmission rate. When that call to repopulate fully comes, we'll let you know. I just don't know when that'll happen right now. President, will employees be required to show proof of vaccination to return to the workplace? And will USU be able to keep track of which students and employees got vaccinated? So that is actually out of our hands. Uh, we are not requiring a vaccination for a condition of employment. In fact, that's illegal, as far as I understand, at a state institution. So we are hopeful with a very positive message about the benefits of vaccination that as many possible, as many people as possible will take uh, up that opportunity, get vaccinated and help reduce the risk of infection. Likewise with students, it is not possible for us to require vaccination. The legislature, Utah legislature passed a bill this year that says a state higher ed institution cannot require that as a condition of enrollment or in attendance. Again, we think our students will understand the benefits of vaccination, will help them get vaccinated as much as we can, and together we hope we can create that safer environment for everyone. Thank you, President. Um, we're coming close to our time. We have time for one last question, but I do want to let everybody know and thank everybody for all the questions that we, we've received today. We will make sure that we get the rest of these questions to you and the administration to see if there's ways that we can um, help answer those in the future. So the last question we have for you today is, what do you perceive to be the biggest challenge facing USU in the near future other than COVID? <laughs> You know, it's continuing our success, but I don't see that as a challenge. I know we're going to do it. We, our people are amazing. And it's that spirit of, of Utah State. It's the Aggie strong. It's caring about others. It's the passion that we have for our jobs and our assignments. It's how we take care of each other. And I think it's going to continue to, to our success and our flourishing is just going to continue to happen. So if there is a challenge and, uh, aspect of that, it's making sure that everybody gives us the compliments and the kudos that we deserve for being an exceptionally strong and successful institution of higher education. And I will do that whenever possible. Uh, sing our praises, tell our stories, and celebrate our successes. So thanks all of you guys for all you do for Utah State.